Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will give you a uh, short introduction on the aurora as, uh, as it is made, as it happens, the physical processes that go on in there. And uh, then um, bring up a few examples on how we are learning about these processes and how we're finding out about what makes the aurora tick, by, uh, especially by um, experiments with rockets that go into the aurora to uh, see what uh, processes may be going on there. But in order to put this into a, uh, a framework of first uh, understanding a little bit of the aurora, I will start out with some historical notes on uh, what we learned about the aurora over, over time. One of the probably oldest uh, written references to the aurora is, is uh, likely to be found in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Uh, there may be uh, older references elsewhere, but uh, they may not be uh, preserved. Of course, it wasn't called aurora back then, and so it's some, it is sometimes difficult to actually find these references. You may read something in an, in an ancient text and say, well, is this referring to our aurora or isn't it? The word, of, the word aurora for northern lights goes back to Galileo in the uh, uh, 17th century. He uh, introduced that not really because he thought this would be a great name for it, but he was at he was studying some things related to the aurora, and he was trying to come up with something to put a name on what he was studying. He didn't mean that as a permanent name, and so he called it aurora, which is the uh, uh, Greek word for dawn, and the Latin word for dawn as well. So it's a combination of aurora borealis and aurora australis. Borealis meaning uh, the, the dawn of the north, and aurora austral is the dawn of the south, and we usually only call it aurora rather than specifying the hemisphere where it, com where, where it occurs. But these old references that you may find in ancient texts uh, often refer to something in the sky that is red and to the north. And red light in the northern sky uh, is usually not associated with sunrises or sunsets or something like that. And so we assume that this refers to the aurora. Of course, back in these old times, uh, there was no satisfying explanation on what that may be. There's an old Chinese legend uh, or mythology where uh, supposedly there is a uh, red dragon that lives in the northern sky. And so, again, we have that reference to something bright and red in the northern sky, and so likely that red dragon in China refers to the aurora again. The, uh, if, if you live here in Fairbanks, you have probably seen aurora before, and you may wonder why all these references are to red aurora, because usually aurora is green. Sometimes, of course, it is red, but living here in Fairbanks, the aurora is green. And then once every few years, you have a red aurora. But if the aurora if, if the aurora gets really intense and spreads out to lower latitudes where all these references come from, the Mediterranean or China or places like that, we need really large geomagnetic storms before the aurora spreads out that far. And if it does, then we usually have red aurora. So there is a selection criterion going on here that if you can see aurora in the Mediterranean, then it is usually red. And in fact, there was a uh, Roman emperor once, I forgot who it was, but he saw the northern sky lit up in red light and he sent his army out because he thought the next town to the north is on fire and they may need help. And when they got there, well, it was still on the northern horizon where everything was red and nothing was on fire. In the Middle Ages then, uh, we have some first, or at least this is what is preserved, we have some printed references which first try to explain what aurora might be. In fact, this, uh, uh, the printing press had just been invented. Uh, this woodcut here on the right side from Germany in the Middle Ages from uh, 1527 
uh, equates aurora with a comet or meteors falling from the sky. Uh, it calls it a frightening comet if you, if you try to translate this very ancient German text there. That, I mean, I am from Germany and I even have problems reading that because it isn't really German. It's a very ancient uh, version of German. So uh, the, one of the first interpretations of that heavenly fire of the aurora was, well, it may have to do with comets. Both of them affair, uh, occur fairly rarely in, these, uh, in the mid latitudes where, where all these observations were made. And so it's not surprising that people try to put, this, put that together, especially if aurora and a comet occur at the same time, which occasionally happens. This year was uh, Comet Hale Bob in 1998. These pictures are here from Fairbanks, and you can see that uh, they are both uh, sort of large objects showing up in the sky. It's not a comet; is a lot larger than a than a, uh, uh, a star or the moon or anything like that. And so, uh, you could understand why people try to equate these two things. The most common explanation for aurora in the Middle Ages, however, was uh, uh, sort of spirits fighting in the clouds or uh, battles of spirits up there and fire being poured out of the clouds. Uh, these mythological explanations that um, we have abandoned since we started studying what goes really on in the aurora or at least with our modern understanding what goes on in the aurora. But again, if you look at aurora, especially at the mid-latitudes, uh, with the various perspectives that you may have, it looks like, well, there's fire in the sky and it's being poured down. And because it is red, it is uh, likely to be equated with fire. In 2003, we had this gigantic magnetic storm, the biggest in 100 years. And so a lot of these pictures come from that very large magnetic storm. So going on to um, modern days, Roger mentioned that the Institute was uh, founded about 60 years ago or so, and before it was the Institute it was uh, an oral observing station. And one of the very first things that were done here at that oral observ observing station was to measure the altitude of the aurora. And the way you can go about doing that is uh, making observations from two different points. Say you place yourself here near Fairbanks and Poker Flat where our rocket ranges these days and have another observer up there in Fort Yukon and you know how far these are apart. If you then look up at some aurora and you can identify that you're looking at the same aurora, for example by taking pictures of at these two locations and then comparing the pictures, you can just use uh, plane geometry and draw a triangle and you know if this aurora is straight overhead in Fort Yukon and, and you see it at an angle of say 30 degrees in Poker Flat and the baseline is 200 kilometers, you can figure out from just very simple geometry that the altitude of the aurora must have been 100 kilometers in this case. Now early in the 20th century, Karl Sturmer in Norway did this on a grand scale. He devised a method of photographing aurora from two different locations and had his assistant over telephone set up two cameras on, in Norway taking stereo pictures of aurora essentially and then devising a very clever method of analyzing all these pictures by uh, again a geometric method projecting them on a wall and because he came up with these clever ways of doing these things, he could do thousands of images. And in fact, over the period of about 30 years, he analyzed 40,000 oral images and made 40,000 altitude determinations. If you plot all these 40,000 points on a graph to see where these altitudes were, you can see that most of them occurred around 100 kilometer altitude, somewhere between 90 and 120 kilometer. Occasionally he would have observations higher up. Those are also very interesting and there's a lot of things we don't understand about the aurora up here. Uh, making aurora that high up in the altitude is not obvious on how that is done. But most of the observations that he did were 
uh, showed that the aurora is somewhere between 90 and 120 kilometers. There's no aurora, say, below 70 kilometers or so. So if anybody tells you that they have been standing on a mountain and they saw aurora between them and the next mountain over there reaching down into the valley or touching the ground, they have seen something else. They haven't seen aurora. The aurora doesn't come that far down to the ground. And there are good reasons for that. But making observations like that, figuring out, for example, that the aurora is always at an altitude of 100 kilometers or 60 miles, if you like, or most of the time, if you make observations like that, uh, you start learning about the aurora and you abandon things like, oh, well, these are, this is fire being poured out of the clouds because the clouds are only, well, a couple thousand feet up. And so uh, eventually you will learn more and more about the aurora and you come up with models and descriptions that are consistent with all the observations that you have made. This is an image of the aurora taken from space in 1982. There was a uh, satellite launched that uh, started taking oral images from space, looking down on the Earth. And one of the things you will notice if you look at the picture on the right here, is that the aurora occurs in some sort of ring that is uh, at high latitudes. Now, the ring is not exactly centered on the North Pole. I've marked the North Pole here with a little cross, and you can see that the center of that ring is more like here rather than the North Pole. So the aurora doesn't really care about the North Pole that much, although it is at high and low latitudes. And if you look at, well, what might be in here, what might be the significance of this area, you'll find out that that is the magnetic North Pole. And so that's a good indication that the aurora has probably something to do with the magnetic field of the Earth. And indeed, I mean, we have, of course, nowadays models and a lot of understanding of this type of thing. The aurora is very much coupled to the magnetic field of the Earth. You can also see, very nicely illustrated on this picture, when the satellite was behind the Earth, looking towards the sun, so that the whole Earth was dark and no sun was shining on the Earth, you could see the aurora on the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere at the same time. And in fact, at the Geophysical Institute in the uh, 60s, late 60s and early 70s, a colleague of mine conducted some experiments with airplanes flying above the clouds so that he was sure he could see the aurora here in Alaska and on the southern hemisphere on the conjugate field line. If you would take a field line from Alaska and follow it down here in sort of a dipole type field line you get down here and you can fly an airplane here and you fly an airplane there and take images of the aurora overhead and they look almost like mirror images. So the aurora does not only occur and on both hemispheres, occur simultaneous on both hemispheres, it also looks the same. It looks the same often down to very, very great detail. So, uh, the question that I get most often is, what makes the colors of the aurora? And of course, I mean, uh, we are used to looking at aurora here in Fairbanks or in, in high latitudes, and we see the, the typical color is, is green aurora. On, okay, on rare occasions, we can see on top of the green some red aurora. And then when the aurora gets really intense, you can sort of see a hint of that. The bottom of that green curtain gets a little purple. You can analyze these colors, we can do spectroscopy on that and find out, well, what makes these colors, what kind of atom has to be excited to make these colors, and you'll find that the green color and the red color both come from atomic oxygen. So we know there's atomic oxygen in the upper atmosphere and that that gives us the color. And that purple color down here, if you investigate that closer and do spectroscopy of it, you'll find it comes from molecular nitrogen. What is also, molecular nitrogen is also the major constituent of the air that we breathe down here. That's another example of a red aurora. Again, you have the, uh, the green aurora at the bottom of it and the red aurora sits on top of it. Uh, this is another example from that 2003 storm uh, in Europe, taken in Europe somewhere. And then at the bottom of the aurora, you, you sometimes have that 
really nice purple or pink edge on it uh, that takes really intense aurora. The reason for that is that the oxygen atom that makes that green light is a little bit unusual in, in terms of how atoms make light. In order to make light, the atom needs to absorb some energy first and then it keeps that energy inside for a while and goes back to its ground state, radiating away that energy as light. Normally, that takes almost no time at all, a microsecond or less. But that green light for the oxygen, that process takes almost a second. And so when the oxygen gets, gets excited in this area, it takes a while before it sends out the green light. If you go down too deep in the atmosphere, then uh, the oxygen makes collisions with other atoms and loses its energy that way and never gets a chance of radiating. And so what you have left then is the nitrogen that at the bottom of the edge, uh, at the bottom edge of the aurora can give you that purple light. So by studying the aurora and the colors of the aurora, you can actually learn something about what the particles, what the atoms in the upper atmosphere are, are like. There are other methods, of course, but studying the aurora is one of the methods that help you confirm that. Down here on the ground, we know that uh, the air consists mostly of molecular nitrogen with about 20% or so of molecular oxygen mixed in and a whole bunch of other stuff, but that's really, really down here, hardly anything. And then from the aurora, among other things, we know that if we go up to higher altitudes, so we have the red aurora on top here, for example, Everything is dominated by atomic oxygen that makes that red light, and then some of the green light, uh, the green light also comes from atomic oxygen. This process even works on other planets. You can make observations of the aurora on Jupiter or Saturn or Mars or some other planet, and you can find out what kind of gas they have in the atmosphere up there without going there and taking a sample. So how does, how does this aurora thing come about? How does this work? Uh, of course, I could lecture hours and hours on that, but the basic principle or the, the basic most important things are on the sun we have uh, activity that evaporates part of the solar, so, uh, solar atmosphere. So part of the solar atmosphere is constantly blowing off the sun. We call that the solar wind. And the sun will be used up in a few billion years, and then it will be gone. <laughs> Partly because it's blowing its atmosphere away. So uh, the solar wind gets blown out into space into all directions, and of course comes by Earth. Earth has a magnetic field, and because the solar wind is a magnetized plasma, it has to go around that magnetic field. Earth's magnetic field protects us from the solar wind. If we didn't have that magnetic field of Earth, the solar wind would impinge directly onto the atmosphere and would probably do us some harm here. So the, the um, magnetic field of the Earth protects us from the solar wind, which has to go around it. In doing so, there's some energy transferred from the solar wind, maybe some turbulent processes or just interacting of fast flowing streams, things like that. Uh, and some energy gets transferred from the solar wind into that space that is uh, encompassed by the magnetic field of the Earth, where the magnetic field of the Earth is the dominant thing that controls everything there. We call that area the magnetosphere. Inside the magnetosphere, this energy eventually, of course, energy conservation means that energy, you, you put energy into something, you also have to take some out, out otherwise things will get just loaded with energy, get hot and explode. So some energy or that energy that the solar wind puts into the magnetosphere has eventually to go out again. And part of that goes out at back to the solar wind, but part of it makes it to the inside of the magnetosphere and eventually energizes particles which are then guided by the magnetic field into the polar regions. In the polar regions, these energetic electrons collide with the gas that's there, with the air that's, that we have around the Earth and in that process of emit light. So the aurora comes about because the sun transmits energy to the magnetic field of the earth and the magnetic field of the earth gets rid of that energy by shooting particles into the atmosphere which then make light. 
the, I have a movie that sort of illustrates that process a little bit. This is an animation that I get, got from NASA. This is supposed to be the sun. And you can see that there's uh, sort of the upper atmosphere is supposed to be streaming out here. It's flowing away from the sun uh, at very high speed. It takes about two, 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 two to three days for that solar wind to reach the Earth. Then it gets diverted by the magnetic field of the Earth, which is this, these blue lines are supposed to be the magnetic field lines. And the energy inside that magnetic field contorts that magnetic field until something happens here, shoots particles along the magnetic field line into the polar regions where you get, as a resu uh, result of that, the aurora. Now, we understand the big picture of this and how this works in general, but there are some details of it that we don't understand yet. For, exa for example, I said, well, something happens there in the middle of the magnetosphere and then suddenly all these electrons get energized and get, uh, flow along the magnetic field into the Earth. And NASA has just launched a year ago or two years ago, whenever it was a large space, uh, spacecraft mission with four or five different spacecraft to investigate exactly what goes on right there at that point when this whole thing goes, uh, blows and sort of starts its process. They are getting the results now, but there's still a discussion. You look at the literature and one person says this and looks, and another person looks at the same data and says the exact, the exact opposite of it. So there's still a lot of discussion going on. And I'm sure we're not going to quit aurora research just because we have these satellites up there. So then these energetic uh, particles come into the atmosphere. And this is supposed to be an uh, uh, oxygen atom. You can see the nucleus and these red things are the electrons that are captured, that are part of the atom. The green thing that came by, came, came by was an, uh, this goes way too fast. The green thing that came by was a um, uh, oral electron. It ex excites the electron in the atom, which then gets rid of that energy that it has in there by emitting the green light of that makes the aurora. And then that happens all over the sky, of course, wherever these electrons come in, wherever you have enough electrons coming in and you get uh, these auroral curtains or patches or uh, all kinds of forms of aurora. This is a time-lapse movie of a whole night of auroral observations. Uh, Paul Jensen does this as a hobby. He's also a graduate student at the Institute working on unrelated issues. But as a hobby, he takes pictures of the aurora. Time clicks by here, you can see these are not seconds, these are minutes and hours and minutes and so you can see how fast time clicks by. And then it's a, it's a camera that sees almost the entire sky from the northern horizon on this side to the southern horizon on this side. And then if you uh, do this often enough, once in a while you catch a night with lots of good aurora and you see these curtains coming by, you could see on some of them that the bottom edge is green and sometimes you can see that the upper part of it gets a little reddish. Uh, the satellites coming through the image here, uh, since everything is speeded up, this uh, looks un unrealistic in a way. We have all kinds of different oral forms, not just these uh, curtains that you saw at the beginning, but uh, these pulsating patches that show up here. And then once in a while, especially in, in areas that are more diffuse. You can see these black things moving through here. This is really, of course, the absence of aurora. That's why it's black there. But because it has such a well-defined shape and looks almost like an aurora curtain in black, we call that black aurora. And again, we don't really know how black aurora comes about and why these gaps in aurora sometimes exist. Here you see more of this pulsating, flickering type of aurora the same thing, the uh, diffuse patch here turning on and off and keeping its shape while it's doing that. We still don't understand how that works and why it's doing that. So there are lots of details about the aurora and about the uh, processes that make aurora that we do not understand. And some of these things uh, you, can't, you cannot just figure out by taking pictures of it. You have to go there into the aurora and make measurements right then and there when it takes place. So we have rocket campaigns that shoot rockets up there to uh, make observations, measurements of a specific type to look at a specific problem of, of the aurora that we don't understand yet. As we get into the morning hours here at the end of the night, 
You can see here the, the sky is getting a little bit bluer here, the sun is coming up eventually, uh, but you have a lot of these diffuse pulsating patches. That, that's a typical phenomena that we often see in the morning hours uh, after a big auroral event in the evening. You can see the sky is getting really bright now and eventually of course the sky will, de will be too bright to see the aurora. But what you can see right away is the aurora doesn't, doesn't make any attempt of turning off just because it gets bright. It's just that you can't see it anymore. And in fact the aurora goes on all day long. It's just that the sky is too bright to see it. But if you have a satellite looking down on the aurora from above in a suitable wavelength in the ultraviolet, you can actually see the aurora during the daytime as well. This was sort of, you can see the entire sky in this image and uh, as I said it was a time-lapse movie so time went by very very quickly. But you can also look at a small patch of aurora. This is just a very small patch like if you look up with, with binoculars and time runs in real time here. This is a camera that we have at Poker Flat that is sensitive enough to take aurora images, at, uh, 30 aurora images a second so that's, typically, that's regular video rate and we get these images at uh, a fairly high resolution at that speed. And you can again see all kinds of things going on that... I'll play this again here. You can see that all kinds of, of phenomena going on that if you actually look at it, look at the aurora with your, with your naked eye, you wouldn't even see much of that because it's such a small piece of the aurora and it goes so quickly. And this camera, of course, is so much more sensitive than our eye that um, a lot of the things that go on there are looking so foreign, so unusual that when, when they don't agree with our everyday observation of aurora. And m much of the processes that take place here is, uh, are still a mystery and, and we are trying to figure out how that works. Now one of the tools that we use to figure these things out are rockets. Uh, the reason for that is that um, the type of atmosphere that you have up there at 100 to 200 kilometer altitude where the aurora takes place is awfully difficult if not impossible to simulate in a laboratory. We just cannot make a vacuum good enough for that with a chamber big enough for that so that the same processes that take place in an aurora can take place in a laboratory to do an experiment and say okay what happens if I do this or what happens if I do that do the processes that take place in aurora then also happen. So we can't make artificial aurora in a laboratory, which means we have to go to the real aurora if we want to make observations locally in, inside the aurora. We can do a lot from the ground by remote sensing, by looking at the aurora, by using all kinds of different instruments and methods of observing aurora from the ground but it is uh, sometimes necessary to really be there or fly over the aurora or in inside the aurora to get uh, data that you cannot get from the ground. So you, you can, these are from uh, long time exposures from different ro rocket experiments. You can fly a rocket in multi multiple stages. The first stage burns here and then this is the burnt out first stage that falls back to the ground just across the valley. Then the second stage ignites and goes further up and then there's a very short line here for the third stage burn and then here's an explosion that takes place that distributes some material there that you can then observe from the ground and see how that material reacts to the same stuff that the aurora reacts to. But now you have one less unknown in your equation and you can try to figure out, well, if you can understand what this thing does then maybe you can understand what the aurora does. Here's a similar experiment where it's just, you can see the various stages of the rockets, four stages, and then you can't see what's going on afterwards because it's just an instrument package that flies along there and takes uh, uh, data as it flies over the aurora. Or you can put, instead of putting something way up here, you can put something right there inside the aurora. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. This is a, uh, like a con contrail from a rocket right inside where the aurora is. We have, uh, as part of the University of Alaska and uh, especially the Geophysical Institute, we have this um, rocket range, this Poker Flat research range just north of here, 40 miles north of Fairbanks in Poker Flat, where we can launch rockets to 
study the aurora or other upper, upper atmosphere phenomena. We can't go into orbit from there, but we can uh, fly up high, high enough to get into the aurora. Uh, we can uh, launch, pretty much we are limited to launching into the north direction. These, uh, these areas, he, area here is, are where we can fly through and, and have rocket experiments. We are not allowed to fly into Canada, so we can't go any further than here. And on this side, we are not allowed to fly over the pipeline, just in case something falls down there. We didn't want to uh, uh, hurt the pipeline doing that. So we are limited to doing our experiments here. And on a map of Alaska, this doesn't look like much. But this is the largest rocket range in the world, where we can, the largest, I mean, off as far as rocket ranges goes, where we can do experiments. There's a rocket range in. Scandinavia, and if I were to plot that on the same scale, you would probably just not be able to see it. It's just a tiny little dot here. There's a rocket range down in New Mexico, White Sands. It's also just a tiny little dot where they can do experiments. Of course, you can't do aurora experiments in White Sands in New Mexico. And we can, uh, one of these corridors you can see extends all the way to the ocean, so we can fly actually into the Arctic Ocean and drop our payload our rocket into the Arctic Ocean after the experiment. Sometimes we want to get the instrument back because it collected some data that cannot be transferred or it has a very valuable instrument on board that is worthwhile to recover. And uh, then we make the effort of putting a transponder on it and a parachute and try to rescue that payload after it comes down. Most of the time that is too expensive, it is cheaper to build that same instrument over again if you want to do it again. And uh, the rockets just crash into the Arctic Ocean, fall through the ice and fall into the ocean, uh, bottom of the ocean. Uh, with the rocket range comes uh, a bunch of antennas here to get the data back, radar antennas to follow where the rockets go so that we know what's going on. And of course, uh, data links. Lots of computers to get the data and process everything fast enough so that when the rocket transmits its data that nothing gets lost. And of course the rocket launchers themselves. Uh, there are, uh, we have uh, five rocket launchers there and we can put several rockets up into the air in, in short succession f with that. Uh, we have facilities to put together the uh, instruments on the rocket there uh, and clean rooms and so on. And to do these experiments. I will uh, show only two examples of actual rocket experiments and uh, uh, discuss a little bit about uh, the significance of these experiments. The first example is, uh, is maybe a little baffling, but the question is why is the aurora green? <laughs> And I told you, well, it's atomic oxygen. You do, do spectroscopy and it's atomic oxygen that gives us that green color. And we know from other places, from other experiments, uh, what the composition of the atmosphere is, including studies of the aurora. And we know the altitude of the aurora. And you put all that together and you can see the altitude where the aurora comes from is about 100 kilometers or so. But if you look at that altitude where the green light comes from, atomic oxygen is not really that much, I mean, it isn't the biggest thing there. Most of it is molecular nitrogen. So you would think when these electrons come in and excite everything that's there, molecular nitrogen would be the light that you should be seeing. Maybe 1% or so should be green line, the green light from atomic oxygen, but that's not the case. So there's a mystery here, and of course you can try to do this in the lab, but creating the conditions that you have up there is nearly impossible, and you cannot really create that green line in the lab at all. So uh, the solution to that would be, well, some type of chemistry takes place. That molecular oxy oxygen gets excited into something and stores the energy into some place and then pr produces some chemical reactions. And at the end of these chemical reactions, eventually there will be oxygen coming out and then the oxygen that is locally produced in the aurora will make the green light. Now that's a good idea, but it's very difficult to show well what chemistry goes on and what's possible there because, as I said, many of these things you cannot do in the laboratory. And really the only way is to fly a rocket up there and see, well, what goes on locally. Make measurements, well, what are the 
particles, what are the densities, what goes on, can you do an experiment shining a light on the, on the stuff that's there, getting some resonance from it or something like that, figuring out what chemistry goes on there. And that was mostly done in the 60s and 70s, mostly in the 70s of, of the last century or the last millennium, if you like, where uh, a number of rocket experiments were done to test one or the other hypotheses to find out, well, what is that chemistry that goes on there that at the end produces that green light? So we now understand that chemistry that goes on, and I'm not going to go into the details and try to explain it to you. I'm just trying to... to to show you the significance of what you can do with local measurements by making sort of a chemical analysis of what goes on inside the aurora, directly there where the aurora takes place. The other example is, um, well, when we have an aurora, what's the environmental impact, if you like? What does the aurora do to the upper atmosphere? And again, you can come up with models, you sort of know, okay, if something, there's a lot of energy in the aurora. The aurora comes down, there's a lot of energy involved, so stuff must be getting warm up there. Now, if you're heating up air, you would expect it starts rising. You have sort of convection going on then. And uh, that sounds all very good, and then you can see, okay, is that, does that have anything to do with reality, or am I just making this thing up? Is this sort of what I like to go on there, and, or is this really what is going on there? Now, you can make a, f a few observations of how the air moves up there from the ground. That's not very easy, but it can be done. And in fact, Roger Smith is one of the people who did a lot of the pioneering work there and, invent, and, and built instruments to invent methods of how to measure how the air moves around up there. You do that by making use of what we call the Doppler effect. You all know what the Doppler effect is, except you don't apply it to the aurora. When you hear a, uh, a source of sound, like a car or a siren or so, coming towards you, it sounds different than that same car or siren going away from you. So by analyzing the sound of a sound source coming towards you or going away from you, you can figure out which way it's going. You can even figure out how fast it is going if you do that analysis right. Now that also works for light. It's a little bit more difficult with doing this with light, but you can see if you have a light source coming towards you, it looks a little bluer than it should be looking, and if it moves away from you, it looks a little redder than it should be looking. Since we know the colors of the aurora, the oxygen emissions that are there, since we know them very, very accurately, where there should be, which wavelength, which color that should be. We can make observations of these colors with very sensitive instruments and find out, oh, this thing is coming towards me or it's moving away from me. And so we can figure out something about the wind up there. And by doing this, you can... Uh, what I did here is I combined wind observations using, using this method. This is shown by these yellow arrows here over the whole sky. This is an, an imager that looks at the whole sky all at once and does this analysis all over the place. And then superimposed to that image is the, uh, uh, the aurora image in green and in red. You can see there's aurora going on and the wind is changing around, but it's mostly sort of, you have a good wind blowing across here. This is only the horizontal wind. This analysis is very difficult to do with wind, wind that goes up and down. So this is only the horizontal wind. And as, as the night goes on and the aurora becomes more intense, you will see that it has a profound effect on the wind. I mean, it, is, it changes that whole wind pattern. This aurora is sort of, I mean, it's impressive aurora already, but it's not the big storm yet. But you can see suddenly the wind turns around here and almost dies away. And then this whole thing just explodes in aurora. And then the whole wind blows up again, goes, turns around 180 degrees, blows in the other direction. So obviously the aurora has a very, very strong influence on the wind up there. Not that there's a lot of air moving around, but that little bit of air that is moving around is moving at fairly high speed, and that is very much controlled by what the aurora does. Now, you can come up with different methods on ex trying to explain that. We know the aurora modifies the environment because it makes light, it makes ionization, so there may be an interaction between the ionized part of the ionosphere of the upper atmosphere, which we call the ionosphere, and the neutral part of the, ionos of the upper atmosphere. And that interaction may be, there are electric fields that, that 
push these ions around. So that interaction may then change the wind. And uh, you know that the, we know that the aurora deposits a lot of energy, so there's a lot of heating going on, so maybe some of, some of the air is starting to rise, and if you have air rising, you have to, ha have, to have air in flowing in from the sides again to make up for the, for, the, for the air that rose up, because if you have a parcel of air here and you have a vertical wind and it rises up, you wouldn't create a vacuum below here, you would have the wind from the sides coming in to fill in this vacuum. So you can do a lot of these things by uh, a lot of these observations for, of the wind from the ground by looking at it again on a large scale here more or less and come up with some models of explaining uh, well what may or may not be going on. But there were a few inconsistencies that didn't quite make sense and so we eventually decided we need to make really careful measurements of the wind right inside and next to an auroral arc with much better spatial resolution than we can do with this type of instrumentation. And the way we went about doing this is shoot a rocket up there. On this particular rocket flight, we had a payload that consisted of a number of instrumented parts. You can see here in the payload assembly, we have the, the nose tip of the rocket here, and then there are various parts of that rocket, and then the motor will go at the bottom end of this. So there are a number of instruments here, that make measurements of what goes on there, what kind of particles are there, what's the temperature, things like that. And then at the end we have what we call a chemical release experiment which, which spills out a, uh, a gas that will glow and you can see it moving around in the sky. Just like a contrail from an airplane, except you can do this with a rocket, you can do this at 140 or 100 to 140 kilometer altitude. In order to do this right, we, uh, we had several uh, rockets there. We had, uh, these are the, the trajectories of, these, of the rockets that we fired up there in, in very short succession. And one of them we did a very special experiment with. We launched the rocket on the first and second stage like any other rocket. But before we ignited the third stage, we turned the whole rocket around so that it would shoot horizontal rather than going in a, in a parabola as a, as a regular rocket would go, it would go almost horizontal over a very long distance. So you can see this here, which would make a long trail, hopefully across an oral arc, and then if we can see this trail being distorted by the oral arc, maybe we can learn something about what the wind does, uh, what the wind is there, and how the aurora influences that wind. These are just more pictures of, of, uh, of the rockets that we shot up, uh, launched up there. The, the, just the nose tip here and here's some part of the instrumentation in these rockets. And We did the experiment, we launched the rocket. And this is what that looks like when you put this substance up there into the <coughs> this glowing substance into the upper atmosphere. This is from a regular rocket, came up here, went more or less straight up, and we started the release of the substance here, and then we turn this release mechanism on and off to make little, little dots in the sky. So we draw a dotted line, and then we observe every dot from several ground stations, and using the same triangulation methods that you can determine, to, that you can use to determine the altitude of the aurora, you can then find out, well, how does this dot move in the next 10, 15, 20 minutes? These are visible for about 20 minutes or so. So you will be able to measure the wind right there because this dot starts moving with the wind in over the period of 20 minutes. This is, this is a leftover from one of those vertical rockets and this here is the horizontal rocket that I was talking about that was turned around and made a long horizontal line across the sky as it was flying over. So again, we make a dotted line and we, we measure the behavior of each of these little dots to uh, see what the wind does. Okay, I have a time-lapse movie of that very night where we did this rocket experiment. Uh, again, time is clicking by very quick here. These are minutes, these are hours. You know, lots of aurora going on. So the rocket flights are just going to be blips here. There's the first rocket, there's the second rocket, there's the next one and the next one and that, that was the horizontal rocket. So it goes very quickly, but you get an idea, you're shooting these rockets through the uh, aurora, you, you're putting these puffs of material out in there, and the 
material moves around with a with a neutral wind that is then influenced that and you you measure that way how the aurora influences the neutral wind and what it does to the neutral wind the end of the night uh, got a little cloudy here so uh, uh, but Paul who made these movies let the camera run so when we do these experiments we get the data back we try to make sense out of the data and of course we had this image in our head on what is supposed to happen you have an aurora there it heats up everything air is moving up air is moving in from the side if it was like this we would understand everything and of course it wasn't it was completely different we couldn't make heads or tails of it at all we actually had to do the experiment over again on a different aurora to see whether every aurora behaves like that or whether we had an anomalous case and we measured more things and we still cannot make heads or tail on what that wind actually is doing up there is it that the heat is driving everything and pulling in air from the side is it that air is just rushing by and the aurora is diverting it and turning it around and because of that there's a vertical motion induced or so we just don't understand it yet and in fact we have the next rocket experiment planned to do a similar experiment again measuring even more things making even more dots not just along a trail this time but we want to we figured out we needed information all over space it's not enough to make just one trail and measure how that trail is distorted by the wind we need to make three dimensional measurements of the wind around one of those aurora if we want to make any progress on that so the next rocket experiment is already planned to do exactly that make little puffs of this material around the aurora and then measure the wind in three dimensional if you like around the aurora and maybe we can learn something from that then and figure out what that wind is doing but as the state of affairs is right now the wind around the aurora is a lot more complicated than you think it is thank you very much that is all i had to say tonight thank you for that very interesting program i wonder on the last rocket shot that you showed how many man hours did it take to think that through and to then do all of the rocketry as well as the science? Um, it takes us about, uh, I mean, coming up with the idea is one thing. But then once you have the idea, you put this together to a proposal to NASA. That takes about three, four weeks of intense work of convincing somebody else that this is a really good idea to do. And then once you get the money from NASA to do the experiment, it takes about two years or so to prepare for this, to build the instruments, to get ready for it. And then it takes another year or so to do the analysis of the data. And when I say it takes a year, that means that maybe two or three people are working on this a little less than half time during that period. So I don't know what that comes to in man hours. Maybe you have somebody walk, working on it for a year at quarter time and somebody else working on it at half time or something like that to come up with some really good results. Usually you involve graduate students in that. They work on it, of course, full time and they usually get the best results because they have most of the time of it and they have uh, a very vested interest of getting results. <laughs> they need to write a thesis after this is done. I know if I've seen in this, this thing of the magnetosphere and it showed that it went in a circle but the polar regions looked unprotected. And what, does the solar wind affect those polar regions? Uh, yes, it does that to a very smaller degree than the rest of the magnetosphere. If you remember back at that movie, something happened in the middle of the magnetosphere, in the middle of that whole protected area. And if you take the geometry of the magnetic field that we have and you go from that place and follow the field lines anywhere you want to go, you'll end up in this ring around the poles. If you go the other way, if you place yourself in the middle of the pole, in the middle of, the no of that oval where the aurora is, and you go the field lines up to see, well, where would that source have to be if I wanted to have something there? There is a small area where you are essentially directly connected to the solar wind. Now, if you look in that area with very, very sensitive cameras, you can see some very, very faint and diffuse aurora. But the big aurora that we see, the, the fantastic aurora, the, these green curtains that we have all over the place, they come from our own magnetosphere. We are make, Earth makes that itself. 
It just gets the energy from the solar wind. Dick, uh, appreciate the opportunity. Very interesting program. This past summer we had an opportunity to uh, tour the rocket range and uh, that also was very interesting and this added to it. I got a, a number of questions. Uh, if the uh, magnetic field and the solar winds are affecting the uh, aurora borealis, uh, is it my understanding or is my understanding right that uh, the magnetic field up in the f northern portion, just west of uh, Greenland, uh, as it moves around or is it moving around? Uh, yes, the magnetic field is moving around. Okay. And it's a, it's a variable thing. It, the magnetic field is made by motion of liquids in the core of the Earth, in the very center of the Earth. And these, uh, it, it is, it, this generating process of the magnetic field is a variable process. So it changes a little bit. And the magnetic field moves around because of that. And the aurora would be affected by that. Okay. Curiosity question, uh, how long have you been shooting rockets up into the Arctic Ocean from uh, down here? Um, I don't know how long they went all the way into the ocean, but I think we launched the first rocket in 1967 or 68 or something 69. like that. 69. 69? 69. And we have launched four, five hundred? I don't know. Um, in total, 2,100, but of the really big rockets, only three or four hundred, yeah. And how much coordination did you have to do with the Russians during the Cold War to set um, everything up? We, we still do. Still when, when we launch a rocket, we inform NORAD and the FAA and places like that. And NORAD informs the Russians so that they know there's a rocket coming that is... Because if you, if you watch this rocket coming up, it looks like it's going to Moscow. Okay, if if right. you follow that path, if you bigger, put a bigger motor on it, it could go all the way over the pole and land in Moscow. And so we have to make sure that they understand that's not our intention. Right, right, right. Now, uh, lastly, uh, uh, if one wanted to go out to uh, the area at Poker Flats uh, for an observation of these firings, uh, do you have a schedule for the firings, or is this... Uh, no. The... No. the, okay. the uh, the way that we launch rockets is usually, at least those for the Aurora research, is usually that you get ready, you put your rocket on the rail, and, and you're ready to launch. And now you wait for the Aurora to do its thing. You may have to have the, the Aurora right over Fort Yukon because that's where your rocket flies through. So if, or right over Arctic Village, or right over here, or you want to have one curtain here and a pulsating patch over there because you're flying that way. So you're sitting there all night long waiting for the aurora to do its thing. If it doesn't do it, well, you come back the next, the next night. And you may be doing so for weeks. <laughs> so there's no schedule. We have windows because very often or usually you need to have very dark nights to see the aurora and to have the ground observations to support the rocket launch. And so uh, you need both the moon and the sun below the horizon. And you can look, you can work out when that is in a calendar, and that gives you two week periods every two weeks, every four weeks. So you have a two week on period, a two week off period, approximately. And we launch rockets during those two week periods where it's dark. But when in this two week period is up to the person who does the experiment and uh, waits for the right overall conditions to push the button and have the rocket launched. Do you have a website? Uh that uh, has sort of a uh, idea of when you'd be firing or how you're progressing? There is a, the PokerFlat webpage does have the windows, the launch windows on it and what is scheduled for which launch window. But when they launch within that window is, is everybody's guess. Okay, thank you. Enjoyed the show. You're welcome. Actually, I've got two questions, but uh, uh, the, the first one is in relation to your last uh, answer. Uh, from launch time to arrival at altitude, what is the approximate flight time? And uh, I understand barium is used as a tracer. Uh, why did you choose barium? Okay, uh, the, uh, uh, it takes about five minutes or so for the rocket to get to the altitude where you want to make your measurements. And you need to have a countdown, a minimum countdown of approximately, again, five to ten minutes from when you have to know 
or when you get to the point of no return. So you need to know about five, 10, maybe 15 minutes in advance on what the Aurora is going to do. That adds a lot of guesswork to when to launch Aurora, uh, when to launch a rocket, because uh, it's difficult to predict Aurora 15 minutes in advance. We can do some of that, but it is difficult and, and not very reliable. And many people have launched a rocket because they thought it was just about right. And by the moment the rocket got up there, everything died out and there was no aurora left over in the sky. And the second part of your question, the barium. Barium was used in, again, there was mostly in the uh, 70s and 80s. There were uh, a number of experiments done with barium. Barium has the ability to ionize when the sun shines on it. So you can have conditions where it's dark on the ground, but say up at three or 400 kilometer altitude, you can be in sunshine because it's not that long after sunset, and especially here at northern latitudes, it, uh, you can have these conditions very easily. So it's pitch black on the ground, you can see the aurora, you can see everything that goes on, but you can place your barium cloud up there in the sunshine, and then when the sun shines on it, it ionizes that barium and it starts glowing. That is why barium is so useful for that purpose. What we did in the, in the recent experiments that I showed you here, where, where we essentially put these contrails up, these rocket contrails up in the upper atmosphere, we don't have the sun to cooperate with us. It's, we, it's too far down, so at 100 kilometers, if the sun shines at 100 kilometers, it's also bright on the ground. I mean, not bright, but it's too bright to really do our oil research. And so we have to have a substance that glows by itself. So we wait until it's really pitch black, and then we put a substance up there that glows by itself. And that, uh, what we use for that is, is what we call TMA, trimethyl aluminate. And that is, um, it's, it's a liquid. If you spray it out into air, it spontaneously uh, combusts and burns. And if we do this up there in that thin air of the upper atmosphere, that process of burning the substance is so slow and takes so long that it actually glows for something like 15, 20 minutes or so, and it's very nicely visible from the ground. What sort of computer modeling has been done of the Aurora? Um, well, we do a lot of computer modeling, of course. We uh, have models that, that model just sort of what happens on a very, very small scale, almost on, an, on a molecular scale. Uh, how the light is produced, and which light is produced, and what that means for the environment. You can do a lot of that with computer modeling, but then once in a while you need to do a real experiment to ground your computer models in the reality. There are also computer models that uh, look at how the particles that make the aurora get accelerated in the first place, where get, how they get their energy, what provides that energy to that, and how these processes work. This is interesting if you want to know these curtains of aurora. They sort of waver back and forth. They have little curls in it. If you want to know how this structure comes about, you need to understand how is the energization of that process going on, what goes on there, and how is this, uh, how is this working. Again, we can do this with computer models, and if you get the same curls, and, or, or these little curls and waving curtains, you think maybe you're doing the right thing. And then you may want to put a satellite or a rocket up there and, and see whether other data that you need to put into your computer model are actually consistent with what nature does. I've noticed that the news miner oftentimes has an auroral forecast. What actually are they telling us? The, the auroral forecast is actually made at the institute, and then the news miner takes it from us and prints it. What we're, what we're doing there is we're using, um, we're using the fact that the solar wind, as it originates from the sun, if it has perturbations in it, when these perturbations reach Earth, they wiggle the magneti magnetic field more than just a smooth solar wind. So if we have some means of observing the sun and predicting and, and seeing these wiggles there, and then knowing that the solar wind takes two to, th two to three days to reach us here, and if we have some more data, then maybe we can refine that prediction, and even we even run a model to do that prediction, to propagate the solar wind all the way to the Earth, then we can say, okay, Three days from now, we probably have a good chance of seeing aurora. That's just one tool that we use. There are other methods. For example, the sun turns around itself every 27 days, and regions of activity on the sun tend to persist for longer than 27 days. So 
if the sun com comes around and makes, has a really big perturbation somewhere and it makes some good aurora, there's a good chance 27 days from now you'll have a good aurora. And you can see, if you look at the whole sun, you can see that region, a, a sunspot or it, whatever it may be, move across the sun. And only at one spot it will actually be effective for the Earth. But you can see it coming around the limb. So a week in advance, you can already say, OK, this thing is coming again. And you can make a prediction. Maybe. Maybe, maybe a good prediction. You can make a prediction, and it, then it depends a lot on how good that prediction is by actually looking at it. If you're properly funded, could you create aurora conditions in a lab? Um, not the real aurora conditions. You could make something that is very similar in many respects to aurora, but you cannot really recreate the real conditions of an aurora. Even uh, back in the beginning of the 20th century in Norway, the guy, one of the uh, researchers that I showed, Karl Sturmer, who did all the altitude observations, um, there was another Norwegian, Christian Birkeland, who did a lot of aurora studies and he did laboratory investigations. He had a vacuum chamber and put a magnet in it and then shot electrons into it and see how these electrons find their way to the magnet to make light maybe on that magnet. And um, so you can do some aspects of that in the, in the laboratory. What is very difficult to do is to make that green light that we get from the aurora. What is the mean free path of the atomic oxygen Oh, I or don't the know. speed or something. How far? How big it's a chamber uh, do you need? Oh, probably hundreds of meters or so. I was wondering if there are any studies done on the Aurora Australis, like the studies done on the Borealis. Oh yeah, I mean, we, for example, in the uh, 60s and 70s, we flew airplanes to to look at the uh, how how similar they are. There are also uh, observatories down there on in Antarctica to look at the uh, Southern Aurora on a regular basis. The problem with the southern aurora is that it is mostly over ocean and the weather down there is not all that good. Of course you need clear sky to see the aurora. So it's difficult to make observations from the ground except in Antarctica. And uh, there are some, some of the Antarctic stations do make regular auroral observations. But it is a lot more difficult to do anything down there compared to up here in the northern hemisphere where we have all this land mass and we can set up a camera almost anywhere we want and an instrument anywhere we want and uh, logistics are a lot easier here and so most of the studies are done in the northern hemisphere. I saw that when on a science fair when I was in, a, in the 60s and 70s in high school they um, had pointed out that Bora Royalis and Bora Astrealis occurred at the same time and they were almost identical twins I saw that during IGY, and that got me to thinking about the summer when uh, it's no doubt there uh, and here too. Oh yes, I mean uh, these these, ex these these airplane flights that I was talking about showed how similar the aurora is, and um, of course when we have winter here, they have summer, and vice versa. So only during fall and spring do you have darkness on both hemispheres at the same time, where you could potentially do experiments like that. All right, thank you very thank much you. for coming.